This episode of the Dungeon Cast is brought to you by Tabletop RPG, Raven of the Scythe. If you like your games just a little more dangerous or a little darker than traditional high fantasy, Raven of the Scythe is the game for you. This tabletop RPG is geared to favor low or medium magic settings and offers a complete rule set with rules for character creation, combat, exploration, and interaction. You can download Raven of the Scythe right now for free at drivethroughrpg.com and see what it's all about. Or you can find it on kickstarter.com. Just search Raven of the Scythe. Follow the links below and check it out. If you would like to advertise with the Dungeon Cast, you can reach out to us at thedungeoncast at gmail.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Will. And I'm Brian. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons, from dastardly devices to dubious dudes. And today, we're talking about Death Knights. The Dungeon Cast. So let's talk about Death Knights, Brian. I think we should. Okay. <laughs> this will be the third installation of our October Spooky Fest. Woo! Happy um, Halloween almost, everybody. In- indeed. Uh, tell me. Tell me of the Death Knight. So Death Knights are very powerful undead beings. They're essentially undead martial champions of evil. Um, they're, they're, they're so powerful, they're just shy of lich-level power. Shit. So I think their challenge rating in f- the 5th edition Monster Manual is something like 17, so quite high. That's pretty high. Yeah, it's very, very powerful um, entities. Uh, they could definitely serve as your big bad evil guys at the end of a campaign or just a general powerful boss um, at high levels. They're very Really powerful. powerful. Indeed. They're depicted as either skeletal or corporeal undead donning heavy armor and weaponry. Um their empty black eye sockets hold a single orange or red point of light for their pupils. Their voices are noted to be deeply chilling to hear, and they almost sound as if they're coming from deep within a cavern, like deep within like some sort of hollow, resonant chamber. Oh, know. fuck. Yeah. Okay. It sounds very unnatural. Is that the thing that rides that dragon or whatever into battle in Lord of the Rings? Oh, the Nazgul? Um... The Nazgul are kind of like this weird halfway point between like a and d Wraith and a and d Death Knight. There's similarities to both, but, you know, Tolkien's work, it's not Dungeons and Dragons. There's just a lot of parallels, but it's some somewhere in between those two things. I would say yeah, Death okay. Knight way outpowers one of the Nazgul for sure. Okay. Even the Witch King, I would say. For sure. Okay. Maybe. Wow. I would say maybe the Witch King is about Death Knight level, actually. Because uh, super he, he can do crazy shit. Super Gandalf was like... Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, that's oh, true. No. he was. I need a ho- I need a Hobbit bonus. <laughs> Super Gandalf, I love it. Yeah, it's, well, like, have you seen that yeah. meme where he like, oh, I convinced the party to move forward so I could fight the Balrog and steal I, its I XP have. and show up with new robes I next did. session. I have seen. Yeah, that. it was yes. good. Okay, so unlike Lichdom, uh, Death Knight Hood can be attained through a multitude of methods. Uh, most commonly, a Death Knight is a powerful and wicked humanoid warrior that's raised from the dead by a powerful uh, entity like a deity of death or a demon lord like Orcus, or or maybe the dark powers, like some powerful evil entity will raise up a very powerful humanoid and be like, you're going to be my servant in death now. You're my death knight. Okay, cool. Um, the other most common method of a death knight, of death knight creation though, probably the, the not, I wouldn't say the most common, but the most commonly talked about method of people becoming death knights is by the tragic fall of a paladin. So typically... A paladin that breaks their oath and falls from grace will either go the the route of like a black guard or an oath breaker paladin, either for life or until they end up like properly atoning and like changing their evil ways. Okay. Um, but if a paladin of like the highest order of good and valor, like a truly like pure hearted individual, ends up for whatever reason forsaking their oaths and actively turning to evil, and then that those deeds lead to their death, that um, being will end up being cursed by the backlash of their tragic fall, and they'll arise as an undead monster on so, uh, Death Knight. Yeah. So if one of Bahamut's, or Bahamut's best bros goes rogue for, like, Lolth or something crazy like that. Yeah, just, then, like, a hard switch to the evil side, yeah. And, and then it's, like, day reason. two of their, like, Lolth stuff, and they just get blasted and die by, definitely like, some high-level wizard with a fireball or whatever. Right. Then they... They're just a de- they're just a death knight now. Yeah, but also like they they'll also have to have done something terrible as well, not just switch. Well, yeah, sides. man, it's day two. Death day one was a fucking doozy. Yeah, okay, so death one was a massacre for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, no, absolutely. Yeah, the switch over is always real rough. I I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And the the way I see it is like this is the alignment chart kind of expressing itself again, where there's just just massive backlash from. Some something so good and pure becoming so evil and wicked so quickly. For every frame of the alignment chart you move through, like it, something <laughs> volatile is happening to you. Right, inside. sure. <laughs> so, so they'll be cursed and they'll rise as a death knight, and 
um, said never that they can never die until they atone. So is there is that like a power increase on the, the paladin that went through it or a decrease? It's it's definitely an increase, but also a lot of time, a lot of the times, not all the time, but a lot of the times, these entities that end up becoming uh, death knights, these beings, were powerful in the first place. That's yeah, how they yeah, got the to- job. Totally, right. I, I get that, but yeah. it, like that's why I'm saying I would definitely like, say it's an increase. Though. Okay, for just sure. like a wizard becoming a lich is an increase in power. Oh yeah, yeah. That okay, that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. So. As 4E does, uh, it has its own take on Death Knights. Oh, yeah. What hit me? <laughs> and it's really cool, I think. So uh, in 4E, 4E claims that Death Knights are created from willing individuals that have to perform a dark and secret ritual to a great, po- great power and undeath, just like a lich, mm-hmm. right? And just like a lich, uh, the ritual itself isn't spelled out anywhere, so it's pretty much at the DM's discretion. But it is hinted that the ritual likely involves the spilling of a lot of innocent blood and the murder of a close loved one. Is, is a big part of it, probably. It's hinted at. It's alluded to. It's like when they want to watch TV in uh, Hello from the Magic Tavern. They have to murder a horse. Oh, God. I, do. I <laughs> forgot about that. They yes. want to watch Mittens games. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> so, um, uh, oh, also, and this is a, a lot like Lich Dumb, uh, the ritual is horribly hazardous to those involved if any mistake is made. So it's a huge risk factor. Okay. Like, if, if a Lich, uh, if a wizard performing the lich ritual fucks up that could end up like this monstrous thing called a bone claw yeah um it doesn't say what could happen to a death knight i think it's just you'll just die only, if you fuck it up only half their only half their soul makes it into the vase i guess so yeah and now they're a horcrux yeah basically <laughs> okay <laughs> so basically the the ritual can go wrong very easily so you have to not just that. like do bad things you have to do a ritual too this isn't for you for oh, you okay. lore, that's why oh, sorry yeah no 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 that's fine it's it's all very convoluted and conf- conflicting anyway so in for you you have to want to do this exactly okay exactly and uh another significant difference that for presents with their death knights is the existence of powerful objects known as soul weapons Ooh. so uh, yeah i know <laughs> That's what that was my reaction to. Uh, so essentially, uh, the Death Knight ritual, it will it tears the soul of the caster out of his or her body and into the caster's weapon of their nice. choice. Nice. Like that. Yeah, this transforms the weapon into a sort of phylactery called a soul weapon. Uh, the caster's body is then at that moment simultaneously consumed in green fire and the soulless bones and rise up as the death knight. That's cool. But the soul is kept in the weapon. I got a good visual from that. Yeah, it's, it's very, very <laughs> uh, good imagery. Um, so although the soul weapon holds the soul like a phylactery, the soul weapon is actually kind of the polar opposite of a phylactery. Um, you know, w- going back to the lich, like a lich's phylactery holds its soul, but it's also as great as weakness. So oftentimes they're hidden away in some secret, hard to get to place in right. order to preserve their immortality. But with a death knight's soul weapon, it's actually their greatest strength and they're always brandishing it. So, uh, just by holding the soul weapon and having it within their presence, it greatly augments their power. Nice. Gives them like a fear aura and all this other bullshit. Okay. Um, also the soul weapon itself, um, it phases through weapon. Or it phases through armor and shielding oh. and just gets straight to the body. Oh, no. And it causes uh, the victims to, like, burn with, like, it says burn with death, but I think uh, the, me- <laughs> <laughs> the mechanics are here is, like, black necrotic flames. What's wrong with your arm, Jimmy? <laughs> it's burning It's burning, burning a lot. I think, is that death burning on your arm, Jimmy? Right. Exactly. I don't know. It's black. They're just so edgy. What's so. that thing they do in Naruto? Like, the black fire? The like Itachi does and oh Sasuke? the uh, Amaterasu yeah, yeah it's yeah. that that's it, black it death yes. burning yeah it's exactly like that yeah, yeah. yeah. it just goes through your why death. is there so many Naruto parallels on this damn show I'm, I'm watching I'm watching Naruto right now I'm gonna make parallels wherever I can oh, find for them sure, that's for my sure. job nice so it's, a, uh, it's a good show I like this show it's fun <laughs> damn it's like so you're wearing plate armor and Don't then matter. like it just goes through it and now you have a wound under your armor you can't get to to treat. Very, very true. Well, I mean, healer, and you're on fire. I mean, healer could just like go through there, right? Yeah, you know, cure wounds. Sure. Done. Yeah. Um, so not only all of this, but a death knight never has to worry about the destruction of their soul weapon. If their soul weapon is ever destroyed, they can just, it, with a snap of their fingers, bring it back. That's broken. A single thought. Okay. Um, only four e. Are we back? This to is 5E? this is four e. Now I know that sounds broken, but like the flip side is in four e, you could just kill a death knight. Like you just oh, it'll punch just him down. enough, he'll die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that with a lich. You like, could still hit him in the helmet and give him a concussion. 
Well, maybe not a concussion, but <laughs> yeah, you, you get the point. You can drop his HP um, to zero. Now, you can separate a Death Knight and 4E from their soul weapon, and this will weaken them to a certain degree. And also cause them to become incredibly distracted and distraught by the loss of their soul. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll just completely be consumed with the need to recover it. I feel you, Death Knight. Yeah, indeed. But, um, but then again, there, there's a double-edged sword here, too, because no creature besides the Death Knight themselves can wield the sword. Uh, if you try and wield a soul weapon um, without being the Death Knight that that soul weapon belongs to, you will succumb to despair and have the life drained out of you. Just like Harry Potter. Is it? Yeah, because Ron wears the locket at Horcrux, and then he's like, fuck you guys, I'm not your friend anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. And just like it's, leaves. Yeah, that's very and, like, similar. As soon as he leaves, he's like, oh, I fucked up. Right, yeah, I remember <laughs> that. I remember that. Um, Yes, very much like that. Cool. So yeah, that's um that's four E Death Knights, and that's their lore. And I think it's really cool, and you can really use either. So um where was I? Oh yeah. So whether by their own volition or without consent, um, the Death Knight becomes a Death Knight. Um the existence of a Death Knight is alluded to being a miserable and cursed one. So Death Knights can never know joy and they can never know comfort. They can't eat or drink. Uh, they can't feel the warmth of the sun or the touch of another person. Due to their horrific and undead nature, they find themselves alone and isolated with only other mindless undead about them. Um, and they're perpetually cold, hungry, lonely, and devoid of positive emotions. They're very unhappy. It's just like uh, Pirates God, of the Caribbean? Yes, it's yeah. exactly like Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean. Yeah. You better start believing not, uh, what is it, ghost stories, Mrs. Turner, because you're in you're one. You're in one. Yeah, yeah that one. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking, it's just like that. Yeah, because he, he talks about... out of the apple. Yeah, he talks about like he's tired of like not being able to feel anything. He's tired of being hungry and starving and right. not being able to eat. That's a Death Knight's experience. Damn. Yeah. Very much so. Except he can't just return the treasure or whatever. Yeah, no, it ain't that easy. Spill the blood of Bill <laughs> yeah, Turner. Indeed. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. We're overdue. You know, I just We're overdue want, on a well, Pirates Well, here's the thing. Like, every you, time, every, no, you're welcome. <laughs> and every time we bring up Pirates of Caribbean on the show, it's always Dead Man's Chest. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the best Wait, of no, the series. Wait, no. Isn't Dead Man's Chest the second movie? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and you're always bringing up. No, part this of is the, the ship, first part of, one. Yeah, this one's part. Yeah, that's one. Oh, to. yeah. Okay, yeah. that's just saying. The, I think this might be the first time we've brought up the first movie. I mean, it's quotable in a lot of ways, but no thing is better than part of the ship, part yeah, of the crew okay. to me. Fair enough. Fair okay. Enough. So, a Death Knight will retain all their memories and knowledge that it had in life. Um, will also retain most of the original personality traits that it had, which are probably not good because it's a Death Knight now, and you don't become a Death Knight because you were an awesome person. Um, <laughs> But, well, you were an awesome person, and then you just decided not to be. Well, okay, you weren't an awesome person at the point of your death. Do they remember their life? Like, as yes, a, they re oh, they okay. retain all their memories. So they knowledge. they don't know joy; they knew joy. They knew joy, yeah, yeah. and that even makes it worse. Yeah, because yeah. you know what you're missing out on. <laughs> Indeed, oh for sure, <laughs> bummer. Um, well, not really. I don't feel bad for these assholes. But reg regardless <laughs> of the traits that they do or don't keep, uh, all Death Knights tend to be very brooding and wrathful. It's also fair, fairly common for Death Knights to, generally speaking, be arrogant, power-hungry, charismatic, domineering, and remorseless people because these are the kinds of people that are either being selected to become Death Knights uh, are turning themselves into Death Knights or inadvertently, accidentally falling into Death, death Knighthood. I see. So, like, yeah. So that's just the general personality. You come home for the traits. holidays, you're like, sorry, mom, I accidentally became a death knight. <laughs> I know, whoops. <laughs> Fuck me, right? God, I don't know what to say. Can right. I still eat here? Can right. I have dinner? <laughs> <laughs> so most death knights tend to act alone. They're just very solitary creatures by nature. Um, they'll, they'll take command of some ruined castle or fortress, raise their own private army of undead, and then they'll just kind of seek to conquer an entire territory. And sometimes they'll just build a fucking empire. Nice. Okay. More Death Knight just over this entire empire. So, Bummer. Yeah. Just because one guy got real bummed out. Yeah. Just because. Yeah. Exactly. Now for their minions, Dark uh, Death Knights. I keep uh, I keep almost saying Dark Knights, but it's Death Knights. <laughs> <laughs> for their minions, uh, Death Knights uh, tend to prefer undead that are capable of falling complex orders. So that means no zombies. No zombies allowed. Mostly skeletal warriors, wraiths, sword wraiths, which we talked about in the last episode. Whites are very common, and even vampires are, are good servants for a death knight. For sure. Yeah, anyone who has the intelligence to just uh, complete complex commands and military structure. I imagine like a death... I want an uh, art commission for a death knight's castle that has like a no zombies allowed sign on it. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be hilarious. Um... When not working alone, Death Knights will usually find themselves in alliance and service of other powerful undead beings. So oftentimes they'll be serving like liches or demon lords or other Death Knights, maybe forming like a like a dark uh, Knights of the Round Table kind of deal. Oh man, yeah. that's crazy. That, that'd be really cool. Or uh, a Draco Lich. 
you know, they, they work in tandem. Wow. Uh, the thing about the Death Knight is it's on such a high level that it might not necessarily be a servant. It just might be an ally of these of these beings. Okay. Although these being these other beings are also so powerful that they could theoretically subjugate the Death Knight as well. If they wanted to. Yeah, if it came down to it, it could go that way. That's why Death Knight's in an army, huh? Just kind of buffer against other powerful yeah, creatures. But I mean, liches will ra- will raise undead armies too. That's true. Yeah, I could totally see like a death knight and a lich going at it, and who knows who would win necessarily. So death knights have a tendency to be able to cast spells as well. We'll get into their abilities. You later. have like a mini reflection of the like the blood war going on on your like material plane with like two powerful entities like this. Yeah, they're just fighting it out forever with their undead armies. Right, right. Like looking at each other from their keeps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. Um. So these Death Knight alliances, they can last centuries because, you know, all these beings tend to be immortal. And due to Death Knights having a mostly kind of lawful nature because they probably had one they in life. Paladins, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they tend to serve fairly loyally and keep whatever oaths that they make. However, because of their evil nature, inevitably the, dark, the Death Knight will betray whatever alliance that it made when opportunity strikes for like a power grab or whatever. Okay. Um, all in all, the closest... A Death Knight can come to having any type of like meaningful personal relationship is with their loyal mount. Like their horse? <laughs> well, due to their horrific nature and power, no horse will ever allow a Death Knight to fucking ride it. <laughs> no horse is allowed. Like, no, no, more like no <laughs> Death Knights allowed on this back. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's what it's, br- it's, yeah. it's like laid into the saddle. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> no so, Death Knights. So Death Knights, usually the only animals that will like bear them uh, would be like a nightmare or a skeletal war horse. You know what okay, a nightmare yeah, sure. is? Have yeah. we talked about nightmares? I, I kind of. They're like, uh, you know what a hellhound is? Yeah. They're like a hell horse. Okay, sure. We'll talk about nightmares more another day, but essentially a hell horse. I think I've only I've homebrewed a multi-headed um, hellhound. You did. That was really cool. That was a lot of fun. I remember that fight. It was it was really funny too so the way it went down. Yeah, it was. Um, so so yeah, just like the teamwork that's necessary between rider and mount, um, just kind of forms a bond between them. So that's the closest a death knight will ever have to a meaningful relationship. Hey man, horse. it has four legs and runs. So whatever. Right, indeed. Like. I didn't, doesn't need a horse. So let's talk really quickly about like how to kill a death knight because it's a bit contested. Okay. So, okay. According to the Five E Monster Manual, the only way to slay a death knight is to find all of the things, the trinkets that it broke its soul into. No, okay. the only way a death knight can die, according to the Five E Monster Manual, is if it atones for its sins in its past life, which essentially makes it fucking immortal. Because why would it ever do that? Besides the fact that it's miserable, it is an evil. Entity. You trick it into going to group therapy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that maybe. That's how you have to beat um, it. Charisma checks. Yeah. In 4E, like I said, you could just punch one to death. Right. Uh, you know, uh, it's outright killable, but uh, obviously not easy. 4E um, is set up to punch everything to death. It's true. It's very <laughs> true. Um, now, I don't really... I do and don't like the what 5e presents because I like that it's kind of cool. It's like the Death Knight is trapped in its own like prison. But at the same time, like, okay, well, if you're a party of people trying to actively kill a Death Knight, like it's just not possible. The best you could hope for is to destroy its body and then it's going to arise from the dead in some other time and place. But you, you never know when or where. There's not like rules like how remember our vampire episode last year and you can like put it in a coffin and blah blah right. blah. Right. There's all these rules on how you can kill a vampire. Try to hold it under the water. Or... Nothing, <laughs> nothing is presented in 5e, but I do have a few suggestions that like I would say that you could implement. So like one thing is like okay, well maybe with a lot of powerful beings one of the, that can't die, one of the ways that you can normally kill them is uh, reduce them to zero HP and then use a wish spell to wish them dead. Ooh, like you could do that for a death knight. Okay, sure. So that's You're one. probably at a level where somebody's got wish going yeah. on. Or maybe if you can't kill them, maybe there's like some sort of ritual you can come up with where you banish them permanently to some demi realm. Yeah, effectively killing them. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Lord Soth, who we'll talk about later, uh, he's a powerful death knight. He gets banished. The dark powers take him into uh, the the Ravenloft setting for a long time. Oh, okay. But he's and he's the only entity to make it back to his home plane. He's just that level of thug. He had to like transcend, we'll get into it later. transcend Wizards of the Coast publications. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, another thing is like, okay, well, where? So regardless of the fact that the Death Knight is a Death Knight now, the soul of the original being be- was probably being sent to one of the many negative planes, from the Abyss to Beator to Pandemonium, depending on their alignment. You, your soul goes to the outer plane that it. When the, the Death Knight appears? No, okay. So when all mortals die, their soul basically is kind of weighed and measured. 
Sure, and, yeah. And their soul will go to whatever plane it is that their soul is aligned to. Oh, okay. So all of these death knights were evil, so their souls were consigned to go to whatever negative realm that they were. Ah. Uh, so because of that, I would say, well, what if you killed a death knight on the plane that the soul was supposed to go to in the first place? Maybe that's a way to permanently kill them, kind of like demons or devils. Right. So that's just another suggestion I have. Or you kill it and its soul just like appears in front of you. Well, yeah, it's soul will appear, and then because oh, it's it'll in be the soul. plane, in the plane that it that it was supposed to go to, it can't make its way back to its undeath because it's already being claimed by the plane. Is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so again, this is just a suggestion that I'm like for cool ideas on how to kill a death knight. All right, sure. Yeah, none of this is none of that is canon. Yeah, it sounds like if you, a death knight is your like campaign boss, that you like, need a way to kill it. It's gonna heckle you for a long time before right. you figure it out. That could be like the whole premise of the campaign is like we keep beating the death knight. Down right, and but he's not dying. Yeah, and it like costs us something every time we do it, but we right. need to like make this guy stay down. Exactly. So these are just a few suggestions of how you can do that. With that being said, let's take a short rest. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to the part of the episode where we're not talking about the last thing we were talking about, although I enjoyed it greatly after all the anticipation, like a year's worth probably. Um, we want to talk about how much we love you. <laughs> we love you. Okay. Yes, we do. We if do you can hear much. the sound of my voice, thank you so much for listening to the Dungeon Cast and for telling people that you know about it. To help uh, with the incentive of telling people you know about our show. We're running a contest right now that Will's going to tell us about. Indeed we are. So uh, as most of you probably know, uh, Wizards of the Coast is coming out with a brand new um, shiny um, source book. Mm -hmm. And it is a setting as well uh, called Guild Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. And we're giving away two copies. And the way you enter this contest is if you spread the word of the Dungeon Cast and share the show with people on social media, whether that be Twitter, Facebook, uh, Tumblr, uh, just an email. Like wh whatever it is, if you share the show and then like send us a screenshot of you sharing the show, you'll be entered into the contest. Oh yeah, uh, I guess I, this is now is a good time to bring it up. I I may I converted my Instagram into the Dungeon Cast Instagram because I didn't really use my Instagram that much. So if you guys <laughs> want to hop on there and share the show, I will occasionally post pictures of us, cool, and things of D and D related nature. Awesome. Maybe. And we've been we've been getting uh, quite a few videos of people sharing the show, and it's been really really interesting. I haven't so. seen any of those. Oh yeah, dude. Oh, you got to check out the email. I've like, seen the people, bumper sticker thing yeah which, like, people have been shout out to you you know who you are <laughs> you know who you are uh no people have been like like videotaping themselves sharing the show with people it's been really cool oh that's hilarious so yeah that's you can do that too like I, you can literally videotape yourself sharing the, the show spread uh, word of mouth you know i i didn't think anybody would do that when i said it but like <laughs> hell yeah it's that's been absolutely happening. really cool yeah it's really cool thanks guys man <clears throat> sweet um, i think we got a special group of people to thank we do um is two a group a two two's a group Thanks, Owen Murphy. Thanks, Owen. And thank you, Anthony Patty. Thank you, Anthony. We appreciate your guys' um, patronage, and this is your shout-out. Indeed, and I hope you're enjoying the, the bonus content there on Patreon. Yeah, I think there are early episodes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, if you are uh, somebody on Patreon, make sure that you're listening to all that good stuff. If you're in the $10 tier, you're getting a bi-weekly game. If you're in the $5 tier, you're getting early episodes. And if you're in the $20 tier, we got some special coming up soon we'll tell you about, but um, not now. Yeah, later. later. Uh, and then we just launched Super Quest Saga earlier in the week, or yeah. last week, I think. We started a bi-weekly YouTube game. Indeed, indeed. And I hope you're enjoying it. We apologize for the audio issues. Uh, we we had some technical difficulties. Yeah, I kind of boofed it on the first episode, but the, uh, the second episode will be much crisper. Yeah, episodes going forward should be much better looking and much better sounding. But give it a shot, because... Um, I mean, as somebody who didn't exactly know what they were getting into as a player, I was very uh, impressed with Will's job as a DM, oh, and you. the story was, like, really good. So I would definitely listen. Um, it's kind of like our world builder in a way. Yeah, we're, we're slowly building the world, and you'll see where this is going. It's really good. Um, I really love all our characters a lot. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're all different in our own way, and it, it just caused a lot of cool role play. Yeah, um, it was a lot of fun role play. It was really cool. But yeah, check that out. That'll be on the Dungeon Cast YouTube channel, right? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it already dropped. Another one should be dropping after you hear this this week. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening to the show again. <laughs> and I love you. Bye. Let's get Let's back, back to back the show. To the show. <laughs> We're back. All right. Let's keep talking about Death Knights. Okay. <laughs> so let's get into what a Death Knight can actually do. 
Um, they because they're you know I've said they're powerful, but what, what does that even mean? Um, so <laughs> <Not> sure. <laughs> so one of the one of the shticks about Death Knights is because they are paladins, um, they still have access to powerful divine magic and they are spellcasters. But uh, one of the the caveats to that is they can never use their magic for healing purposes whatsoever. Okay, so they're still channeling the same divine energies that they were using before. Um, was there well, like some like weird celestial body where they're pulling like latent well, power from? Well, remember that uh, for the most part, Paladin's powers are from their own convictions. So now they just have new convictions. Oh, so right. the, oh, I thought it was, I knew it was their own convictions, but I thought that was like gifted to them from that particular entity they worship. No, not uh, the canon is that, like, yes, Paladins tend to worship gods, but they don't actually get their power from those gods. They get their power from their incredibly like potent belief and faith oh. so like paladins are often more Fuck. pious than clerics when it comes to like their worship if if they happen to be worshiping the same god the paladin is probably way more pious yeah okay i get i get that they're the embodiment of these ideals so that yeah. now they're just okay isn't there like a dark paladin is that a thing well if you become an oath breaker is is the canon thing but, right okay uh the uh, traditional like dark paladin path in D is the black guard which we still haven't really seen um, for this, although they did release like, um, gosh, can't remember the name of it now. In Xanthor's Guide, they released a like a wicked type paladin. I can't remember what the path was. Uh, treachery, I think it was. Treachery was the path, or something like that. Um, and it was like all these dark powers. So like, yeah, it's it's out there. But you can make is, it happen. This is like more, much more extreme. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's actually take a look at the five uh, e. Um, stat block for the Death Knight. So the Death Knight um, has an AC of 20, so incredibly hard to hit. Okay. Uh, about 180 HP, uh, 30 feet of speed. Um, the ability scores for the Death Knight are pretty whopping, especially in the strength and constitution category, both 20s. Intelligence of 12, wisdom of 16, and charisma of an 18. So this is just a really powerful... Like, you could theoretically build a high-level uh, PC character that has these same stats. Right, yeah. Um, so it's still within the realm of, like possibility i guess if 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 for a character um immunity to necrotic and poison damage immunity to exhaustion frightened poisoned um they have dark vision within 120 feet they can speak both abyssal and common and also any language that they can speak in life oh okay Um, they have magical resistance so a death knight has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects period end of story um they have an ability called martial undead so unless the death knight is incapacitated uh undead Undead creatures of its choice within 60 feet of it have advantage on saving throws against features that turn undead. So it's just facilitating everything around it that it would use yeah, in combat. Bas- yeah, basically all the undead that the Death Knight's controlling can't be turned. Nice. Uh, or no, they can be, but they just have advantage on the saving throws. Right. Um, like I said, they have spell casting, and there's a whole list of spells they can cast, like command, compel duel, hold person, magic weapon, banishment, uh, destructive wave. Um, we're going to talk about a Death Knight later who's way more powerful than the stat block, by the way. This is just like a stat block you could use for Death Knights, but... This is a regular Death Knight. Yeah, this is your standard Death Knight. Uh, we're going to talk about Lord Soth, and you he's You buy like, these at the grocery store. Right, you buy these at the grocery store. <laughs> this is your Walmart variety Death yeah. Knight. Um, <laughs> and Lord Soth is basically on another level. We'll get to him. Um, uh, the Death Knight has like a multi-weapon attack with their sword. Um, they also can um, summon a Hellfire Orb, which is basic. It's like the fireball spell. You just throw it and it explodes and everyone dies. Uh, people love that shit. Yeah, people I mean, it's a great spell. Love I love blowing shit up, too. It's Everybody great. seems to. Now, if you ask me, the, the stat block for the Death Knight in the 5e Monster Manual, it, it's potently powerful, but it's definitely got a lack of abilities, okay. if you ask me. Uh, other abilities I would consider adding... Uh, to this stat block in order to get like the the classic Death Knight experience from all the various editions are basically two things. Number one, give it an aura of fear. So I I, I wrote down like maybe like a 20 foot aura where, with a wisdom save of an 18 DC to not be frightened if Ooh. you enter, enter yeah, its aura. Totally. Because every Death Knight I've ever read about has an aura of fear. So it not being here was was a little weird to me. Okay. Um, And then also the ability to summon and unsummon their mount. At will, not not via spells, just like something they could do. Just snap their fingers. There's the nightmare. A portal opens up and whoo. yeah, exactly. That I just think that's kind of like a quintessential part of like the Death Knight experience. If you will. He just like jumps vertically in the air, and you're like, okay, what the fuck? <laughs> and then he just falls, and he's on a horse, and then yeah, he's, like, he's moving towards you. <laughs> <laughs> a little cheesy, but I like it. That's cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's the stat block for the Death Knight. Those are the the general abilities of a Death Knight. Um, let's talk about 
the most famous or infamous of all death knights that I've ever um, been written about in any D and D setting. The headless horseman. In no the story of Ichabod Crane. No, not the headless horseman. So we're going to talk about Lord Soth also known as the Knight of the Black Rose. And he, like I said, Ooh. he's probably the most infamous named Death Knight in Dungeons & Dragons. Super metal. Yeah, indeed. He's originally a Dragonlance character, but he has been featured in Ravenloft setting as well, like I said earlier. You seem to speak fondly of Dragonlance when it comes up. I do, but that's mostly because it's like from my childhood. Like, oh, okay. Like, you could go back and read these books, and they are good, and they have good stories and great characters, but... I mean, they're not like it's not like Shakespeare. Like, well, I mean, just mean like in comparison, like when Forgotten Realms realms comes up, sometimes you give an eye roll. Uh, the, okay, so the the main thing that I tend to uh, uh, criticize Forgotten Realms about isn't a Forgotten Realm specific problem. It's a problem with any fiction that's relegated to like a setting that like countless authors have access to like comic yeah books. okay yeah like i love comic books but comic books have a continuity problem all the time yeah because a million writers across decades are telling stories about these same characters and the continuity gets all messed up that happens with forgotten realms all the time okay so uh the thing about Dragonlance is it was made by two very specific people and even though other writers have been allowed to write in that setting for the most part it's always been margaret weiss and tracy hickman at the core of it all and that's easier to maintain a it's continuity easier to like maintain that a continuity like all that. right yeah although there are other, there are other great writers who have been involved in Dragonlance, and i like their books too and we'll talk about those books one forgotten day forgotten realms is like this melting pot it really is. Okay. Yeah. It's just this big anything is possible town crawling abomination of a narrative. But anyways, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm a little too hard on it on purpose on the show because I think it's funny. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, all right, let's get back to Larsoth. So um, he's a menacing badass. <laughs> yeah. With uh, power to kill even a dragon with a single word. Like he has access to the power word kill spell, which is an incredibly high level spell. And he can just point at a dragon and it dies. Like, <laughs> that's who this guy is. Okay. So. so, dude, I just thought that when we started this podcast, that like we were going to be talking about dragons and like depth a lot. And that's what was going to be the most powerful thing. Mm. And nah, no. never, almost never. Almost never. And we almost never talk about dragons. <laughs> so true. We'll have to do dragons episodes soon. Yeah. But the reason I've been putting up dragon episodes is there hasn't been any like juicy dragon content that come out of it. So blame wizards. Don't blame me. Uh, thumbs down, wizards. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so back and forth So Lord, Lord Soth is depicted as a very, uh, a very large man standing about six foot five in heavy plate armor. Uh, ancient Salamic uh, plate armor, uh, which is where he comes from. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So his armor has actually been burnt black by the circumstances of his death. Um, none know what he looks like because he never removes his helm. And the only thing you can see through the slit of his helm are two red uh, glaring orbs for his eyes. Nice. Um, surrounding him constantly is an aura of both freezing cold and fear, and it follows oh, him everywhere he goes. Oh, that's fucking cool. Yeah, no, he's he's a fucking badass. So in life, Soth uh, belonged to the Human Knight Order, or the Chiv Chivalric Order of the Knights of Salomnia. Now this, in Dragonlance, it's a quintessential, pure-hearted, like, heroic, knightly order. Like, okay. They got their problems and their polit politics and their ups and downs, but generally speaking, they're like... The real fucking good guys. The round table and scenario. Yeah, the round table scenario. They're the guys that are always there, no matter what the situation is. When evil is on the rise, it, it's the Knights of Salamnia at the vanguard. And when it's not on the rise, they're writing poems about unrequited love, etc. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, they, they live by a very strict and detailed philosophy known as the Code and the Measure which is supposedly written out in 37, 300-page volumes. And it's a Great. knight's duty to follow and know these laws. So you want to be a part of the club, eh? <laughs> yeah. We've got some reading ahead of you, son. Indeed. All right. Now, their philosophy can and is often distilled down into one very simple mat mantra, est, est solaris oth mythos, which is supposed to be translated to, my honor is my life. Um, this knighthood is also divided up into three suborders: uh, the crown, the sword, and the rose, with the rose being the highest order and... Uh, only knights who have proven themselves above and beyond what is their like um, call of duty can ever attain this rank. Okay, cool. Uh, this is the rank that Lord Soth was. He was a knight of the rose, which is why he's also now known as knight of the black rose. Um, he had a commanding position and a castle to boot. The dude was an incredibly powerful lord. That's how he got, like, he was a Sir Soth. He eventually became Lord Soth because, cool. like, he'd just done so much dope shit. <laughs> <laughs> so... Despite this, he ends up not being a very dope dude. 
So, while traveling to the city of Palanthus, Soth and a group of his loyal knights came upon a group of female elven clerics. Now, I've said this before, but in Dragonlance, elven clerics are not combat capable. They are robed healers. They can barely defend themselves. Right, okay. Um, so, they're not like normal D&D ropes, so these, the, or D&D clerics. So, these female elven clerics are being attacked by ogres, and... Uh, the knights, of course, come to the rescue. They slay the ogres. They save the elves. But one among the elves was a very beautiful woman named Isolde. Now, Soth was immediately smitten with her and ends up bringing her back to his castle to heal her wounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely going to heal these damn wounds. There's, yeah. There's a problem, though. He's already married. <laughs> oh, I was say. yeah, that is a problem. That's a big problem. You can't be healing people's wounds if you're married. <laughs> you can only heal your wife's wounds. <laughs> Anyways, um, regardless, they begin to have an affair. Um, meanwhile, the wife that Soth has, Lady Corrine, is is and has been having trouble conceiving a child. So while this is all going on, she, in desperation, visits a, a nearby witch. It could be a hag for all we know. She sounds like a hag. Sounds like a hag. I know, right? <laughs> and with the help of her magic, um, oh, no, t- to seek the help of her magic, um, the the witch says that she can help her, but warns Corrine that whatever child she gives birth to will be a physical reflection of her husband's soul. Of course, Corrine's like, great, my husband's a really dope dude. Little <laughs> does she know. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah, the hag knew. So the spell works, and roughly nine months later, two things occur. Asolde is still around. That's the elven woman. Mm-hmm. And Soth gets her pregnant with his oh, bastard. Man. And Soth's wife... Corrine gives birth to a deformed and monstrous child. Soth finds out about the whole witch deal and all this other stuff. He ends up blaming Corrine for their child's appearance and in his rage murders both her and the child. Oh no. This That's is not horrible. this is it gets worse as the story keeps going. Um so let's see. He he has the murder covered up and claims Corrine and the child died during birth, which mm. is a believable story sure. to anyone on the outside, yeah. right? 6 months later, he and uh, he marries a soul day. She she has a child. She has the new the new son. Uh, I can't remember the name of a half of... elf bard that goes on to blah blah blah. <laughs> if only. Yeah. No, that's not what happens. Oh, great. Um, let me see. I, I have notes thing. here. Uh, but at some point, oh yeah, okay. So at some point, maybe about a year after the new marriage, the new child is born, and all this other stuff, one of Corrine, his original wife's ladies in waiting, end up. Sp- like flipping on him and spilling the beans of oh, what, no. what really happened. And because of all the accusations, the the knights of Salomnia end up calling Lord Soth to trial to decide whether he's innocent or guilty. So the trial doesn't go great because a lot of people end up flipping on him, like a lot of people who knew about it, like oh, great. all his servants and whatnot. And so it's really looking like he is going to be found guilty and then executed um, if found guilty. Yeah, if you're if you're this guy's crew, you better all go in on this or some people's going to die. Right. Yeah. So, rather than wait around and find out if he's going to be found guilty, he escapes with the help of the knights he has that are still loyal to him and they flee back to his castle. <laughs> his bros are like, "We believe you, man. Don't worry." I, I know, right? <laughs> and he ends up being uh, besieged there by by the knights and it's yeah. So now he's stuck in his castle. Nice, okay. So while under siege, Soth's mood really blackens and he becomes easily angered. And even at one point, he strikes his, his new wife, Isolde. He hits her. Uh, and upon hitting her, he has this realization that he's become a fucking monster. <laughs> and so he's like, did, oh, I really am a piece like, of shit. I, I suck. <laughs> um, so he and his wife both pray. He prays to Paladine. Um, he's like Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Um, for a chance at redemption. And Isolde prays to Meshackle, that's Bahamut's, or that's Paladin's wife, uh, for the same thing. Meshackle ends up actually answering Isolde's prayer as it presents a path of redemption for Soth. Yeah, she's like, this ain't your fault. So Let me re- help you. Right. So <laughs> real quick, um, a big part of the Dragonlance mythos is an event called the Cataclysm, which during like most of the stories that are being told, the Cataclysm happened like hundreds of years ago. And basically, it was like a world-shattering event that the gods visited upon the world of Kren for um, for the arrogance of mortals, like basically trying to rise up to godhood themselves. It's more complicated than that. But Lord Soth existed before the Cataclysm. As a matter of fact, right before the Cataclysm. So the gods literally tell Asolde that, hey, look, we're about to do a Cataclysm on the world. 
for <laughs> for a completely unrelated matter. This is good timing. We're going to lick our right. thumbs and rub this guy right out. Right. But Soth would be given a chance to prevent the cataclysm. And if he did so, he would redeem his soul. Uh, although he would have to trade his life. So the, 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 the quest is this. is like, look, go to the city of Istar. Talk to the high priest. You're probably going to get killed in the process. But in doing this, you will undo whatever it is that we don't like that's going on. And we won't do a cataclysm. Yeah, so you just have to go. You just have to go, and you have to die. Yeah. So a soul day delivers a message to Soth. Uh, he agrees to sit out on this quest. Oh yeah, by the way, the siege has ended at this point. Okay. Um, they just give up. They or just what? they just got tired of it, and they're like, "Fuck it, you're excommunicated," and they left. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> "I can't just keep standing out here. Yeah, we got other things to do, yeah. and you suck, so you're no longer one of us." <laughs> okay. Bye. Got it. got it. So yeah, so yeah, so so he agrees to go on this quest. But along his quest, he gets intercepted by these three Elven Maidens who were... Oh, no. It's going to happen again. <laughs> who they were, were fighting ogres. <laughs> they can only heal. He has to heal her wounds. <laughs> He's going to heal more wounds. No, that's not what happens. As a matter of fact, <laughs> okay. these three Elven Maidens were clerics that were day- there on the day that he took us all day back to his castle. Sure. And it's not, it's not explicitly said why these elves are hate him. But they start talking mad shit. Okay. And just talking they, that cash yeah, shit. they get real nasty with him and they basically tell him that Isolde is lying to him and that she's being unfaithful to him and that she sent him on a fool's quest so that she can gain his castle and be rid of him. They're like throwing and, bad food at him. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you suck. You're the worst. Um so uh so yeah, he falls for it because he's a fucking sucker. And he heads back home to confront her all pissed off. As he does this, a cataclysm happens. <laughs> The one that he was supposed to prevent. You remember that one? Yeah. The gods checked in. They're like, oh, he's he's going back home. Yeah, seriously. I guess right. I guess Cataclysm is back on the menu. <laughs> Everybody so, get ready. Cataclysm is mean, back on. Yeah, we're talking earthquakes, meteors from the sky, all that. There's a few of the jazz. gods that were like real bummed that it was off. Yeah. And now they're like, oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and it immediately begins. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, with the meteors falling from the sky and the earthquakes, the keep actually catches fire the castle they're in and a chandelier actually ends up falling on a soul day and their uh infant child um damn yeah child death child child it's returned to the dungeon cast <laughs> indeed um so the son ends up not being mortally wounded he's only trapped um but a soul day she's mortally wounded oh man uh, and she begs soft to save their son and he ends up refusing because he he thinks it's not his son. He thinks she's full of shit. He's just a fucked up person. He's lost it at this point. He's completely okay. lost it. And so with her dying breath, she curses Soth to live um, on in misery. So basically, uh, the quote is, "One you will live one lifetime for every soul whose death you've caused, which since he didn't present, prevent the cataclysm, that's a fuck ton of deaths. Okay, sure. <laughs> so basically, forever. Yeah. Um, Soth then burns to death in the keep, but Isolde's curse calls him back to life from the grave as a terrible death knight. So she just like calls out some crazy jinx and he disintegrates right there? Um, well, no, no, no. Like they're in a burning castle. Oh, she curses okay. yeah. him. And he, he can't can, escape. He, he dies, can't escape. but then he rises back up as mm-hmm. a death knight. Indeed. His loyal knights that served him um, to the end there, they end up getting raised as skeletal warriors cursed to serve him for eternity. Dang. And the three elven women that tricked him were raised as banshees and were cursed to follow him everywhere he goes and sing about all the bad things he ever did in life <laughs> every single night for the, the rest of eternity. The last thing that pissed him off really bad is yeah. just going to be around always. Yeah. That's fucking hilarious. And, and the thing is, like, there are a few, there's a lot of moments where you meet Lord Soth in the books and, like, you're, like, in his keep and he's, like, sitting in his, like, audience hall with, like, skeletal knights, like, standing in attendance and he's just got these three elven banshees, like, above his throne like wailing. like screaming at him. They're wailing and they're singing about all the horrible things he did in life. God, yeah. okay. It's epic as shit. Yeah, there's like <laughs> two points of views of that. It's yeah. like, oh, I traveled all day to get to this point and I, I long rested outside and now I'm going to break down this guy's door and this is what I see mm-hmm. versus like that day as Soth and he's just like, oh my God, fuck. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the whole damn day. Indeed. And you br- you break in, he's like, oh, finally, break the silence. <laughs> right. This awful silence. So there are a lot of really cool stories with Soth and he does a lot of really cool things. I'm not going to talk too much about him because, you know, spoilers are really good stories. You, could, you should go read them. I will say that he gets a very interesting ending. Okay. Um, at, at the end of the Dragonlance run, because Dragonlance no longer is published. 
but um, it is it is all wrapped up with a nice and tidy bow. So I, I recommend anyone to go read the if you if you liked what you heard here, check out Laura Sauce. He's a real cool character. Nice. So that being said, I, that's all I got to say about Death Knights. You got any Sweet. questions? Sweet. Um, nah. All right. Well, it was let's good. Call, let's call it a game. Let's call it a game. Talk to you guys later. <laughs> Dungeon Cat.